Welcome to How, How To For Beginners. I'm uh, Henrik Stapelfeld from Aarhus University and I'm one of the partners of the Medea ITN. And today I will be telling you about laser-induced alignment and orientation of molecules. And uh, alignment of molecules refers to ordering uh, molecular axes to axes that are fixed in the laboratory frame. And if you order a single axis, as is illustrated in this view graph here, of a molecule to an axis that is confined in space, then we call it one-dimensional alignment. And um, this concept is illustrated for a simple linear, or even a simple diatomic molecule here, but it actually also applies to polyatomic molecules and more complex molecules, as you can see illustrated on, on this view graph here. So in this case, the uh, axis that is becoming aligned is the most polarizable axis. Let me try to illustrate that with this marker here. Um, so this axis of the molecule is aligned, and again, it's 1D alignment. However, as you can see, for this kind of, of asymmetric top molecule, one-dimensional alignment is not quite sufficient to fully uh, obtain rotation control of the molecule. So what one would ideally like to do is to extend the concept of one-dimensional alignment to three-dimensional alignment. And that's illustrated here. In this case, all three principal axes of the molecule is confined to three orthogonal axes that are fixed in space. So this is 3D alignment. Yet, even with 3D alignment, this is not quite sufficient to control molecules that are polar. And polar means that there's a permanent dipole moment in each molecule. And ideally, for such molecules, you'd also like to have the dipole moments all pointing in the same direction. So have all the red noses pointing, for instance, upwards. And if this can be achieved, then we call it orientation. So in this case, we could have both three-dimensional alignment and orientation, or we could have one-dimensional alignment and orientation. So we'd really break the head for tail symmetry of the molecule at the same time. So before I tell you about how we align and orient more, or at least align molecules, then I'd like to show you just a single slide with the motivation for why we're interested in aligning and orienting molecules. And in fact, <clears throat> The initial um, or the, the prime uh, motivation for aligning molecules, or at least the original one, is the fact that molecular reactions depend on the orientation of the reagents. And this is an old story in, in chemistry. This goes 50, 60, maybe even 70 years back in time. And if you look at reactions between molecules and molecules and molecule and atom, then for the simple fact that molecules are really not spherical objects, then it's kind of obvious that if you approach two molecules, then their reaction, uh, <clears throat> both the outcome and the rate, will <clears throat> excuse me, depend on how the molecules are turned in space. And that's also illustrated here, where an atom approaches a molecule either from the end or from the side. And again, ideally, if you can confine a molecule in space, like this methyl iodide molecule, then you can explore if the reaction is maximized, if the atom approaches from this side, off from this side. So this is a good motivation. More recently, there's been a lot of focus, and this is also the case in the Medea network, on studying the interaction between intense la laser pulses and molecules. And in this case, there's also very strong uh, orientational dependencies in the interaction. Um, so basically, the polarization state with respect to the molecule is uh, basically determining the uh, outcome of the interaction. And this is an interesting story to explore by itself. And it's also something that can be exploited to make use of strong field, for instance, strong field phenomena, and for instance, exploit it to do dynamic imaging, something that's also explored in this network. So how do we align and how do we orient molecules? Well, what you need ideally is you need moderately intense laser pulses that are non-resonant. Moderately intense means that the molecule should be, the laser pulse should be sufficiently intense that it can induce a dipole moment in a molecule, which then becomes aligned. Yet it shouldn't be too intense, and therefore I use the word moderately to emphasize that the molecule, that the laser pulse should stay below an intensity such that it doesn't ionize or fragment the molecules, because we don't want the molecule to be destroyed or undergo any reaction. It should also be non-resonant. Non-resonant means that we must choose the color of the laser pulse that we use for alignment such that it doesn't absorb in the molecule, i.e. we do not want any excitation or vibrations of uh, electronic states. 
So this is often accomplished by using a laser pulse, let's say around 800 nanometer or 1000 nanometer. <clears throat> In practice, all alignment schemes fall or can be categorized into two overall categories. One is called adiabatic alignment and the other is called non-adiabatic alignment. And this has to do with how the laser field is turned on with respect to the characteristic time scale, namely the rotation time scale. So adiabatically basically implies that you turn on the laser field slowly compared to the inherent rotation period of the molecule. So, likewise, non-antibiotic uh, alignment implies that you turn on the laser field rapidly or fast with respect to the rotational period of the molecule. Most small molecules that can be brought into gas phase have rotational time scales of, let's say, a few hundred picoseconds or even less than that, 10, sometimes 1 picosecond. So if you use laser pulses that are on the order of 10 nanoseconds, which are commercially available, then you can ensure the adiabatic condition is fulfilled. Um, by contrast, if you use femtosecond lasers or short picosecond laser pulses, then you can enter the non-adiabatic alignment regime, and I'll tell you about how these two regimes work. So the adiabatic alignment is explained in this view graph using a classical picture, and what you have to envision here is, think about a linear molecule, that you place in a linearly polarized laser field. It's uh, vertical in this direction. In this case, the interaction, in this case, the laser field induces a dipole. And let me get this marker back again here. It induces a dipole, which in turn interacts with the field. And the interaction entity is simply the product of the two. So if we calculate this, I'll spare you for the calculations. Then you see that the interaction <coughs> is given by this expression. So it's the E field squared of the laser, that's the intensity, times the polarizability, or to be precise, the polarizability and isotropy, difference between polarizability along and perpendicular to the axis, and times cosine squared theta, where theta is the angle between the field and the molecular axis. That interaction entity is plotted by the blue graph here, so nd versus angle, and you can see there's a minimum at zero and at 180 degrees, so the molecule wants to be like this, or like this, it aligns. So this is the basic principle of adiabatic alignment. There's a bit more to say because <clears throat> that begins with the quantum mechanical version. So quantum mechanically, you need to solve the rotation of Schrödinger Schrödinger equation um, that's written here. So this is a rotational entity, the kinetic entity plus the interaction that you just saw. So if you solve this, then you find that the solution can be expressed as a linear combination of feel-free eigenstates, this is what we call pendular states, and this superposition basically ensures that you can confine the angle of the molecule. If you want to confine something quantum mechanically, you always have to build a superposition of states. That's what's done here. So, um, on the next graph here, I show you the feel-free states. That's where we start before the laser is turned on. So the molecule is populated in these feel-free states, uh, equal to 0, 1, 2, perhaps higher. And these are the pendular states, so this is the superposition states that describes the aligned molecules. So if you turn on the laser field sufficiently slowly, sustain the adiabatic regime, then each of these states evolve adiabatically into the corresponding pendular states. So if you ensure that your molecules are initially residing in low-lying rotational states, then you end up in low-lying pendular states, which are the best aligned states. So you ideally like to work with a cold molecular sample in the beginning. This can be achieved experimentally by using supersonic expansions. Now let me say a few words about non-adiabatic alignment. Again, the classical picture, you can think about the laser, the laser field here, inducing a dipole moment in the molecule. This is this one here. Again, the induced dipole moment. And when there's this dipole, then the laser will basically exert a torque, which is a cross of the vector product of the induced dipole and the laser field, and this forces the molecule to rotate. So, after a short time, the molecule will align with the field. If the laser field is, if the laser pulse is short, then you can think about this basically as a molecule, as a laser delivering just like a kick to the molecule, forcing a rotation. And as the molecule reaches alignment with the laser field, 
the laser field is turned off. And therefore the molecule just continues to rotate. There's nothing that prevents it. Quantum mechanically, this is expressed by solving not the stationary, but the time-dependent Schrödinger equation is written here. It's the same interaction operator as we saw before. And again, the solution can be expressed, let me get the pen here, can be expressed as a superposition of field-free states, but with the important difference that the expansion coefficients are now time-dependent. This implies that we create, this is a rotation wave packet, and therefore experimental observables varies as a function of time, in particular the alignment varies as a function of time, and this implies that there will be instances of time after the field is turned off, after the laser pulse is turned off, that alignment occurs, and as such it can occur under field-free uh, conditions, which is really useful for applications that may otherwise suffer from the presence of a strong alignment field. So that's an attractive situation to be in, and something that's again used in this network as well. This is just to perhaps illustrate what the laser field does in order to create this rotation wave packet. So it basically induces a sequence of stimulated Raman transitions where both the up and the down photon are contained within the bandwidth of the laser pulse. So it essentially changes a distribution rotation states that are initially, let's say, at low values to a, a large range of rotation states that are coherently populated. This gives the wave packet. This is all I want to say uh, in this short tutorial. So if you'd like to have more information, you're very welcome to contact me on this uh, email. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.